Hey everybody, welcome to Landscape Rescue. My name's Stuart Moore, and on this episode, I'm gonna be showing you what I do with all of my clearance plants. Let's do it. So we're right here at the corner of the berm. So this whole big berm, this is the beginning point. I wanna be pretty methodical about this so I don't miss anything. This is a clematis that I bought online about two years ago and it has done nothing but perform it's my favorite clematis i've ever purchased and i have no idea what variety it is or where i got it from i think uh garden answers had some clematis or some company she was working with and and i just went and purchased a clematis on that website i was looking for a pruning group three which is like the sweet autumn clematis because i really wanted to take advantage of this corner and I couldn't find one, so I ended up going with a pruning group two, which means it blooms on old growth first, and then new growth later on in the year. And I've been very, very impressed. It is not a finicky, whiny clematis, which I like. I like clematis that aren't finicky and whiny and just like being alive, and that is one of them. I've got a huge blackberry thornless blackberry bush that the year kind of got away from me it got very hot very fast and that's probably my own fault because i was you know busy doing youtube and working and i never pulled these little pups out to give away which i mean you can see the amount of berries that i'm going to be getting this year it's crazy the amount of berries that this thing produces and this is one plant and I've got pups all over the place. Anywhere where a branch, like down here, anywhere where these branches touch the ground, it's a very dry year, so it's probably not gonna ha happen this year, but when it's moist, they'll root. And then you can separate it from the parent plant and you've essentially created a clone. Then you can dig up, you know, later on in the year when it's got some good roots to it, you can dig it up and put it in a pot and give it to one of your friends, especially if they're into preserves and jellies and stuff like that because this produces buckets of blackberries the key lime pie and the pinball wizard and then i think there's some fire witch dianthus in here also uh, which is a good one i that's one of my favorites i haven't cut these back and one of the reasons is because this week we're expecting highs every single day at 104. So you gotta remember when you cut stuff back, if you don't have the mulch to then mulch around it, right? You're allowing a lot of radiant heat to penetrate where it wasn't penetrating before. So you just gotta stay on top of the water. I'm letting these go. I'm not deadheading them. I'm not doing anything because I'm pretty ruthless when with dianthus. So I don't really trust myself to go in here and mess with these yet. So um, I usually just ball a bunch of it up and then just cut it flat. I've even been known to use head shears, but that does make the, the cleanup a little bit more difficult. The dianthus is doing good. I have planted all of these this year. What I'm gonna run into is these super, super hot days. So that's where, the, that's where having some sort of drip system up and going so you can be watering in the morning before you go to work turn the hose off before you leave or talk to your significant other and say hey can you run the hose for an hour that's typically what we do um, and that way nobody's got to stand out there in 104 degree weather and water i like to water in the morning and it gives everything a good a good prep for the day which are going to be hot so this is the berm Right here on the corner, I've had this clematis for three years. This clematis is junk. So I really do have a soft spot in my heart, as small and as black as it may be, for white clematis. I really like white clematis. This clematis has been a pain in my butt. Uh, it shows up really, really good in the spring. And then once it just kind of turns to pot on me. Normally what I do, and let me show you how I deal with, with problem clematis. Are you ready? There you go. That's how I deal with these clematis. Not a huge fan of this variety. I went to a privately owned garden center 
uh, that one of my family members was working at and I picked up this Comatis. He wasn't working there at the time. I think he had quit and they were super rude. I don't know. They need to get out of the business because they were a nightmare to work with. Anyway, I ended up getting that Clematis just to support them a little bit. Local garden center, you know, blah, 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 blah. Try to shop at all of them. Yeah, not a good experience. Clematis on the corner, nothing like the Clematis on that corner down there. Uh, that one is the better of the two. Dianthus here, and then now we're actually starting to get into the berm. I think this is going to be very, very pretty uh, in the spring next year, especially with the s amount of salvia that I have in here. There is probably 30, 35 salvia in here, along with the black-eyed Susans and the fire and ice hydrangea. These fire and ice hydrangea are in 100% sun all day long. From the time the sun comes up, the time the sun goes down, these are in sun and they are living their best life. Now, we're gonna see what happens with this 104 degree week we're having. For the most part, I think the fire and ice, little quick fire, fire lights, uh, anything with that type of panicle uh, does very well in full sun. I'm, I'm having very good success with those. Little quick fire, significantly smaller than the fire and ice. I get those two mixed up all the time because I sell a lot of hydrangeas, so my brain just doesn't work. Uh, these are fire and ice. Fire and ice are gonna get four feet tall, which I think will be great just to add a little bit of privacy here. This is the berm. You guys didn't get to see this, but I got these for like $4 a piece. They're pink primrose. And so I've got one, two, three, four, five, six of these. And I really wish I could have extended that drift and just kind of packed them in a little bit more. They only get, you know, one by one. So they're not, they're not huge. But we do have primrose native here, the Missouri primrose. And I thought that would be kind of fun to have something like that here. It's a native R, but they are starting to push new growth at the bottom. So that is a very good sign that they're happy here. And I think I got those for $4 a piece at the Ozark Lowe's location. So they had one flat. I passed on getting the second flat. That's my fault. That's my fault. I should have gotten all of them and just continued this drift, especially because how well they're doing now. But now we know, you know, kind of one of those things. I have popped in clearance salvia all throughout this berm. It's just an evolving process, but this berm is impressing me from, from the first summer this has impressed me. I did Black Eyed Susans. There's a video called Planting 20 Black Eyed Susans. I don't know, it was an early video. Uh, it's funny, but it's not. And what I did is they were so young and they hadn't grown into their pots yet, so I could shake them, just vibrate them a little bit and get those roots to fall out and be real, real long. So the root base on these is at least a foot and a half down their first year. Their first year I planted them. So I dug a really deep hole, got the roots all the way down to the bottom and it sifted topsoil. So this worked out really, really well. For the most part, I have 360 degree sprays in here. There's still some hot spots, but for the most part, I've got everything positioned to where everything's getting a little drink, you know, and so we can run it every two days in this heat and it, keeping everything alive. It's already hot. It's like seven o'clock in the morning. It's already getting hot. The heat index is going to be pretty high today. So you have this berm here, Black Eyed Susans, Fire and Ice, and May Night Salvia, all doing very, very well. If you can notice behind me, I do not have any trees in my easement anymore. So the trees are all gone. <laughs> well, they're not gone yet. They've stubbed them down and then they're gonna, they're gonna trim them out. That's where I keep my mulch pile. In order to get to all of this, I'm the only one that has access. So they had to drive through my yard and <clears throat> they knocked all my pole chips down so they could get their trucks in here. Well, that's all well and good, except for now when I was gonna trim back my May Night Salvia, now I don't have any mulch. So I have to hold off on trimming the salvia. We're gonna add some salvia. I don't know if you guys saw that previously when I walked through. We're just gonna add a couple May Night Salvia in front of these black-eyed Susans. 
I know it seems like I go overboard on salvia, but it's because it is super, super tough, easy. I need easy maintenance on my plants. So for the most part, plants aren't necessarily, I don't feel like there are a lot of maintenance. It's relaxing, I enjoy it. It's a good hobby to have, an expensive hobby as you guys have noticed. Mainite salvia is just so easy. I feed it every three months. Uh, if it, Once my two-year fertilizer tablets are out, uh, once they've exhausted themselves, and then I trim them. I trim them in, in, uh, in early summer. I mean, it works out so well. So I do have a lot of salvia in here, but in the spring, oh, it's so pretty in the spring. They do such a good job. They do work. That's, that's what I like about it. I, I like plants with a good work ethic, and salvia have a very good work ethic. Right here, we have these one gallon dwarf butterfly bush that I found at Lowe's. And I think they were like, were they eight bucks a piece? No, they couldn't have been that expensive. I think they were like four. So we got these for like $4. And there's a couple blooms in here that I should probably deadhead out of here. But uh, I mean, I did this little, this little just, little just half circle to frame out this big giant weeping cherry. So this is a weeping snow fountain cherry. Um, I paid full price for this. I think it was, I bought it at a nursery that I worked at. It was $260, I think my cost, 25 gallon. And I think it retailed for 400. It's probably a 500, 550, $600 tree right now because of how crazy the industry's gotten. If it died today, it would have been worth $265 because I've gotten to witness for three years, it's majesty. <laughs> it's worth it to me. I mean, I'm telling you, if, if it was $300 and I had to spend $100 a year just to watch this thing, knock your socks off for three years in a row, what a great tree. What a good place for me to put it to because if you look, it blocks off this corner very well. Now, I know this doesn't look very pretty. I usually have sunflowers all across here, but they have ran over all my sunflowers and they're apologetic about it. Uh -oh, are we being invaded by the Russians? Maybe. It's okay, I'm prepared. I'm prepared. It's okay, if we get invaded, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, I have plenty of salvia to bribe troops with. They've torn the vast majority of this stuff up. I'm gonna have a couple sunflowers that, that made it over here on the corner. I just hope I can get enough seed out of them to reseed next year. It is what it is. We take setbacks. We take setbacks in the garden. We do. Uh, you gotta roll with it. It doesn't, it doesn't go away. It's something that happens every single year. There's some setback. You're out of mulch. You're, you know, you can't find the fertilizer that you like to use. I mean, there's always little tiny setbacks and big setbacks every single year. These are Daisy May Shasta daisies that are kind of poked in here and they were very well positioned. Unfortunately, uh, one did not make it. Oh, I don't know, 104 degree weather, I might go down. And then I'm gonna poke in, I'm gonna poke in a little salvia right there. Um, I've got, should probably talk about, should probably talk about this, I've got, some white wedding hydrangeas. There's three white weddings. I've got one right there. I've got one right over here. So I'm continuing that panicle hydrangea feel. Now they're gonna be different shape. They're gonna be shaped more like a limelight or a bobo with those dense panicles. So, but they're gonna get taller. And then I have one right here on the corner just to continue that. So you look, it's a very pretty, it's gonna be a very pretty eye line because you'll have three of these white hydrangeas helping each other out. I think that's gonna be, I think that's gonna be pretty fun and a relatively weed-free landscape. Um, I do use pre-emergent. I use a uh, Treflan, Preen, uh, Snapshot. I mean, I'll use all of that stuff. But density is very, very important. So remember when I talk about planting on mass, right? Massive action creates massive emotion. And really, in all actuality, you're trying to create the emotion for yourself, right? You're landscaping for you. You want to just be awestruck by your landscaping. The best way to do that is creating in mass. 
on just the berm, Fire and Ice Hydrangeas, Black Eyed Susan, May Night Salvia, the Missouri Primrose, some Butterfly Bush, Shasta Daisies. So that's six. I mean, not a whole lot of different varieties, so I'm gonna get mass emotion out of this. So with be that being said, now that we're done with the berm, I wanted to show you, well, how are we gonna do this? Because the sun is right in y'all's face. We'll go down here. So this is the easement. This is where they're cutting out all the trees. And this is getting hot. There's a lot of winter creeper euonymus in here. This winter creeper is all over these trees. It's all over the ground. It's everywhere. It annoys me because I can't really do a whole lot back here because I got to fight this winter creeper constantly, which it's evergreen. And it's a good ground cover for stabilizing banks. Unfortunately, it crawls up trees and it crawls on houses and things like that. And I've just never been a fan of ground covers that do that. But if I had a big blank bank where I was just trying to stabilize, I would probably use gray owl junipers actually. I wouldn't, the first thing in my head would not be a winter creeper euonymus unless somebody could mow it. And, and a lot of times if you're fighting erosion, it's because you can't mow it. You can't grow anything on the side because there's no water retention there. It just runs all off. So you have to get some organic matter up there. You have to get mulch, you have to get compost to increase the beneficial uh, fungus. Um, that will basically glue all that together and you have to plant. So usually I go with gray owl junipers, but winter creeper euonymus would work. Bleh. This whole side of the fence, one, two, three, four, five, there's gonna be five white wedding hydrangeas. We're kind of in the junky area, I wanna let you know. It's just lots of pots and lots of stuff that I don't wanna throw away because I'm a hoarder. I've got some more white wedding here on this side of the fence. So see how this one's here? And then I've got another one on this side of the fence, right? So it should create some depth and it will also provide privacy five, six years from now. We won't be able to see uh, our neighbor, but we'll still be able to see the sky, right? So I do like the feeling of vastness there. So like a six foot tall seasonal privacy is great because I don't do naked Pilates out here in the winter time. It's too cold. I go inside for that, right? I don't need privacy 30 feet in the air. I have a single story house. I don't need giant evergreens out here to provide privacy. I want to see the sky. I've got these six foot tall panicle hydrangeas that are eventually going to be pretty nice size. So I've got one here. Then on the other side of the fence, I've got one here. And then on the other side, I've got another white wedding. And then over here, I've got another white wedding and then it runs down the side. When I planted these, I didn't know the county was gonna come in and tear everything to pieces. So it is what it is. Setbacks, right? Down here, I gotta walk backwards because the sun is gonna be right in y'all's face. I got these little balloon flower. I think this is the first time I filmed at Lowe's, I bought these balloon flower. And that's the first time I said, you coming home with me. These are, were 50 cents a piece and they were these little quarts. And I've lost two maybe um, over the year. I don't know. I'm absolutely in love with these things. I love these little guys. I need to deadhead them, but I love balloon flower. I love balloon flower. If you can put balloon flower in an area where it's happy, right by where people walk, I mean, it's always kind of a showstopper. I remember as a little kid, they're very nostalgic. As a little kid, my mom would always fuss at me because I would pop the, I would pop the balloons which then makes them bloom weird. Don't pop them if you can avoid it. If you can, if you can avoid it, <laughs> I know it's hard. So I've got Arkansas Blue Star running the entire length back here. And I thought that would be fun for some fall color because they turn yellow and they get little blue flowers on them. I did want to show you this. I've talked about the uh, pot and pot system. And so basically I have a pot there's a bunch of mulch down here, so it's not setting correctly. I shot this video a long time ago, back in the spring, and then uh, something happened with the footage I can't remember. I know I use that excuse a lot, but that happens a lot because I don't have a cameraman. But you can see it's still rooting, right? It's doing fine. I have this pot that I buried, and then I just set that in there and you can push the mulch up against it just to protect it a little bit. And you can't even tell, you can't even tell there's any, and you won't be able to tell. Unfortunately, it won't wick water to there. So you have to water them directly. 
that's that's the drawback to this is you've you've really got to put some water um, directly into the pot. I don't know. I shot that so that I could show you guys, and then I've just never planted it. <laughs> so these guys were not clearance, but they were in a sense clearance because we had uh, just so many of them that a customer just kind of stuck us with. So uh, just like the white wedding hydrangeas, my boss knows I'm a plant geek. He knows I do this for you guys. And he just said, get them out of here. Just give them a good home <laughs> with a sigh in his voice because it was kind of an unfortunate situation for us as a garden center. Jackson, Perkins, Blaze, Climbing Rose, I paid two fifty four at Walmart. And it really showed up this year. It did very, very well. This, I believe, is Starry Starry Night or Midnight Marvel. I can't remember which one this is. But this is their second year. We planted those last year on video. Um, so you guys can see what Agriform tabs do for your uh, hardy hibiscus at least. And I'm they, they like the agua, so I've got some drip set up here. The This is Hunter Drip Hose. It's got 0.9 gallon an hour emitters every 12 inches. And so what I've done is I've just kind of wrapped each one of these, right? So they're going to have about three emitters. So they're going to get three gallons an hour, uh, which might not be enough, but I run this this whole side is all connected even with the arkansas blue stars it's all connected um, for an hour every other day so i mean they're getting plenty of water or at least i hope they are um, this stays a little shadier but once the sun gets straight up and down in the sky these things get baked for the rest of the day right here on the corner is a luna so this is a luna it's a dwarf hardy hibiscus so you get the same size flower these flowers are huge on the luna as you do on like the midnight marvel and the starry starry nights those one gallon bobos that i found at lowe's i am going to plant them just kind of right through here i think that'll be i, I think that'll be fun uh, to have that kind of summer interest and have them both banging off of each other because these hibiscus, once they start blooming, they bloom uh, for the rest of the year. The flowers only last a day, so you you know you just walk around and deadhead them. And it's very easy. I just pop it off and I throw it in the lawn, and then I mow. But I haven't had to mow really that much lately because there's no rain. Then I've got some echinacea in here that, again, you know you just onesie or twosie echinacea in the landscape. As you can tell on this side of the property. I just, I'm a big Echinacea fan. Um, I, I'm a huge fan of Echinacea. It's entertaining, it's dynamic because of the amount of birds and butterflies that we get. Look, I see one right over there, check this out. So there's a constant supply of entertainment when it comes to Echinacea. Then in the winter, we, we get finches uh, with the Black Eyed Susans and the Echinacea, and I just like it. Uh, we're gonna do a little hatchery back here. I have two clematis back here, one that I've purchased from Lowe's, which is in the back corner, and then uh, one of the clematis that I purchased from my nursery. This is gonna be a little hatchery area. I have some milkweed back here, and I'm gonna try not to put pre-emergent back there so I can have the milkweed just kind of free seed and take that area over. Also going to plant, it's probably going to be next spring, some parsley and some dill back here. So it's just an area that I can just kind of let go and let go crazy. And so that way we can um, start cranking out some monarchs and some black swallowtails. And even if I have to, you know, buy caterpillars for that sort of stuff, I'll do that because I don't use a whole lot of pesticides, really any. I did spray suspend i believe around the house perimeter just to keep camel crickets and those greenhouse millipedes which are really good at breaking down organic matter uh, they're good that's a good insect um 
they eat decaying organic matter, which is basically what our mulch is. So we want them doing that. We want them breaking that stuff out, down, pooping it out so our plants can take advantage of it. So I don't really do a whole lot pesticide wise in the flower beds. So that's kind of the hatchery area. And then you have limelight hydrangeas, sweet summer, limelight, sweet summer, limelight. So you have so you have five really big hydrangea trees just kind of all the way down this line here. They need to be trimmed. They're a little unkept. I get that. But my plan, um, you want to hear Missouri laugh, tell her your plans, was to do some air layering here and then, then cutting the branches. So the branches I wanted to get rid of, I was going to do some air layering and I was going to then in turn get some some hydrangeas that I can just put and I can just poke in to this potentially green fence that I'm producing on the other side of this little picket fence here for some privacy. It's going to be a lot cheaper than a $7,000 privacy fence, which was what I was being goaded into doing, but I am not going to do that. And then we've just got different types of salvia, like the Lyrical series salvia. Uh, some of these uh, larger salvia were, were three and a half inch pots or four inch pots. I paid three bucks a piece for them and just plugged them in, threw some agroform tabs in there with them. And uh, this is year two for those. And they're beautiful. They need to get trimmed. I need to get, I need to get trimming on some of this, but I'm out of mulch, so I'm not gonna trim anything. I'll let it go wild and I'll trim it in the fall. But until I get mulch, I'm not trimming nothing, not in this heat because I don't want that radiant heat to be penetrating all the way to the uh, soil profile. We're walking, we're walking. Okay, so these are Ruby Star Echinacea. I love Ruby Star Echinacea. They're my fa favorite Echinacea that I've ever had. They get big, they get huge blooms on them. And the blooms, like all Echinacea, are persistent throughout the whole year. I mean, it seems like one flower lasts forever. Now, these petals are very sensitive to high amounts of radiant heat. So they will curl, they will turn brown on you, but I leave them because of the amount of food that it provides the birds in our area. I do like, you know, any finches, any seed loving um, birds that are passing through can have themselves a little snack at my, pa at my place, I don't mind. It's like, a, it's like a little hostel for travelers here. Uh, I've got some volunteers. This is a Irish eye, I believe. That's what that is. I had some Irish eyes uh, and uh, throughout here. I'll tell you what, Irish eye rutabecchia, autumn colors rutabecchia, they're not necessarily overly hardy, but man, did they do work last year. So I'm getting more of those. I mean, I'm gonna get some more of those because I was very impressed, especially when you buy them in a little four inch container uh, for three bucks a piece. I bought a whole flat. I think I spent like $60 there that day and I just got tons of flats of different types of rutabecchia. And I got Irish eyes and those autumn colors. And I was just so impressed. It was worth every single penny that I spent on those. And I know they didn't come back. I've had some volunteers come back but uh i'm going to treat them as an annual and i'm going to plant the snot out of them next year believe that so the purple dome master blew my mind last year for its first year i was very very impressed with it it has gotten uh like if i hit it these like little white bugs all over it and i don't know what they are and i don't care because normally at a customer's house Yeah, they're like little scale. I think it's got scale. Um, I would just spray the living snot out of them with, uh, with neem oil. I would just scorch this place. But there's so much echinacea and there's bees buzzing all around me right now because I've got an echinacea behind me and then I'm, I'm kneeling in some salvia. And I've got an echinacea over to my right and I just don't want, I don't want to put them through that. I just don't. So, um, I don't know, another setback, I guess. 
dynamic scale, these little white, little tiny white flies. Pesky. They're being pesky. I don't like it. But yeah, they just got nailed this year. Every single Purple Dome Master I have looks like crap. Where, I guess, the law of averages, last year they looked amazing. So what, what are you going to do? I'll leave them. Maybe they'll bloom. Right here on the corner, you have some more of these Luna. Look at the size of this bloom. Jeez Louise. The whole thing is going to be covered with them. I mean, you can just see all these buds. There's three Luna here, and I have one on the corner over there. So it's not going to block the other ones. So I like to do that stair-stepping if I can with the same, not necessarily the same variety, but if I'm doing hardy hibiscus, I like the Lunas up front. I like the taller um, hibiscus in the back. And it seems to be working out really, really well. We will do an update video on everything that's blooming. Um, so when stuff blooms, I'm, I'm going to talk to you guys about it. Right here, somewhat of more hatchery stuff. Oh, I'm so bad with the names. And then I got some swamp milkweed. This gets very, very wet. So it, it just kind of has a slow, gradual grade as you're coming down this bed with all the hydrangeas in it. And um, I've killed a couple echinacea over here because I had a bunch of echinacea and I didn't realize that yet, but I pulled the mulch back and I saw that it was real boggy. Well, it was a real hard year that first year. The echinacea did fine because it was 100 degrees and we hadn't had any rain in four months. Well, then we had a normal year where we were getting good rainfall. It just killed off all those echinacea. I mean, they were just sitting in water. So I planted these Luna over here living their best life. They've never been happier. Um, and that hydrangea is the, the number one hydrangea I have in that whole row. The best looking hydrangea is because it's just sitting, it's just got tons of water at its disposal. So I planted swamp milkweed right here on this corner, just some, some boggy stuff, you know, that would like that sort of thing. Uh, right here, these are some, you guys saw me buy these. Uh, I think these are... Shalom. There's a couple different varieties. I went through um, when Lowe's had their three for 10 sale. I went through and I just bought a bunch of different varieties of daylily. Um, a daylily is a daylily to me. And they just, they're so pretty. They're, look at that. They're doing very, very well. Back there in the back is a Grit and Glory Rose. Grace and Grit. Grace and Grit. Grace and Grit back here in the back that I transplanted to make room for those Japanese maples that I got from work that were just stupidly cheap. So we just took two of them home. That's, if there's one advantage other than never being able to sit down at working at a nursery or a garden center, uh, cause you're just busy all the time and it's just manual labor all day long. It, it's every once in a while you'll get free plants that are a little sick. And I guess that's where my love for clearance plants came from. An armadillo came through here last night, it just dug up all my yarrow and stomped it all down. So that's why this peach yarrow looks like junk. I've got the pink potion, uh, Veronica, and some lyrical blue salvia down here. This is the pay it forward bed. This is the pay it forward. I'm not gonna pay it forward with my grace and grit rose cause that cost me like 35 bucks. But all this other stuff are things that we can pay it forward. Firelight hydrangea right here, looking good. And that's gonna get tall, hopefully eight feet and just really be a good backdrop for this. More Black Eyed Susans. Here's the Lyrical Silverstone Salvia that we picked up at Lowe's yesterday. That's gonna go kind of right in here. I'm just gonna pop that in. There are the blushing, blushing ruffles daylilies. We're gonna put those kind of back here in these kind of spaces. So I've got three over there. I've got three over here in the corner or not in the corner between the uh, Japanese maple that I haven't trimmed back yet because I was planning on doing a video about it, but oh. Some more Black Eyed Susans. Here's where I planted those 24 Friesland Salvia, the taller varieties. And then our Bobos 
I'm going to continue because I got a really good deal on those Bobos. I paid $2 a piece for those Bobos, those Bobos in the two gallon pots. And so I've got Bobos that are three years old, one gallon Bobo, another mature Bobo, you know, and I'm just kind of popping this through and it's building. I'm building this area with my bones and I'm doing it in a very, very inexpensive way because I'm using clearance plants to do this. So if you think every single one of these salvia was $2 a piece and they go, I got 24 of them, so I spent $48 and they go from right here on the corner all the way to the end of this bed for 48 bucks. Yeah, pretty impressed with that. $2 Bobos and that drift continues all the way that drift continues all the way to right here. So there's a Bobo right there by the Dwarf Fuji Cherry. And so that just kind of is gonna swoop around. I think that's gonna be very pretty. I was a little apprehensive about continuing this drift of Bobos, but when I got such a good deal on them, I mean, I got those for $2 a piece. Why not? Why not just do that? Kind of the rub, I'm just gonna continue that and I'm just gonna make a huge hedge of Bobo hydrangeas to just be a backdrop uh, to all of this stuff and welcome uh, people as they drive by. I mean, I think that's that's what we're going to do because, you know, you get an opportunity to to put a Bobo in there and put some Bobos in the back. I mean, think about what I've got invested in. I've got two over here, five, six, seven. So I think I got seven of those, seven or eight of those. Is $16 to get eight Bobos? Yeah, we're going to go ahead and do that. Oh, and then I'm going to put some... I'm gonna put some uh, some of those daylilies that we got yesterday. I'm gonna put a couple back here, and I'm gonna put a couple right here, and a couple right there, and they're just gonna peekaboo right out of the back of all those um, black-eyed Susans, who, by the way, if you wanna know how well Agriform tabs work, these black-eyed Susans, this is their third year, their second year they were this big yeah i couldn't tell you uh, they can tell you because now they've become self-aware black-eyed susan right here identifies as a portuguese salmon fisherman so i mean i let them kind of establish their own identities unfortunately who is the proctologist i think it is eduardo over there on the corner but it's hard to keep them all straight the Agriform tabs work, guys. It's supplemental nutrition that just slowly but surely kind of gives the plants what they need and they can devote a lot of time and resources to fighting disease and then spreading, which is, is really nice. So they don't have to work overly hard to do what they, they need to do. So we're gonna put some, we're gonna poke some salvia in over here. And so it'll be pretty salvia rich, but this is a very summer focused flower bed so I don't have a whole lot of spring color early spring because I have daffodils in here and that's another thing once you get your bones squared away then you can start popping daffodils in in the fall yep and then let's get ready to party daffodils are kind of a pain in the butt but by the end of June they're pretty much done I mean you could probably cut your daffodils back middle of June and they would still do very well the next year. You just want to give them as much time as possible so they can photosynthesize enough simple sugar so that they can, you know, uh, regenerate and get ready for, for next year, store some energy to put out a bunch of big blooms, produce more daffodils. Like, that's the cool thing about them. Uh, bad for me, they tore out all those trees, no big deal. I didn't own them anyway. They were in the easement, stayed out of the new planting, so they're not messing up anything on the fence. I'm pretty impressed, and they're going to drop chips for me is the deal right if you're going to level out my my mulch you got to bring me more mulch so that's what they're going to do they're going to drop me some chips back there it's a thing that they're going to do so i'm cool with it break rules and walk in the flower bed the coleus are doing fantastic they are looking really really good and uh i had a subscriber uh talk about not necessarily liking this orange color because it, it blended in with my brick. Uh, but I don't think it was necessarily a bad choice. I kind of like it. I liked the color. And so I purchased those. I didn't even think about the brick, but it is what it is. Here's the bird bath that I bought. 
and I told you I was gonna hillbilly it up a little bit. So I made this little kind of steampunk butterfly stand that this little clockwork butterfly sits in. It poops out little gold nuggets was the, was the, uh, the story behind this. And uh, then we've got the little frog that I, um, I'm a real big fan of Dixie Bell patina paint. I use it on a lot of stuff. That's this whole bird bath was just boring concrete. And I put some Dixie Bell uh, copper uh, patina paint on there. And I'm in love with it. I love copper patina. I like iron rust in the landscape. So um, I don't know that that industrial kind of feel around things that are just so beautiful and so dainty. Uh, I think the contrast is inspiring. Let's just say that. I, I love that contrast. Here's a sweet summer hydrangea. And doing pretty good. This is its third year. So we've only been landscaping at this house for three years. Um, and this was one of the first things that I put in and it gets plenty of sun, trust me. But um, these hosses are right there at the sun line. So if you look down the line here, let me see if I can get you guys in the shade. If you look down the line, <laughs> It's nothing but hostas. Yeah, I had, uh, when we first moved in, first order of business was build my beds, right? So I built these giant flower beds and just started filling them. There was two big giant clumps. See, we moved in in May and there was these two big clumps on either side of the door of, of uh, hostas. Now remember, this was three years ago. I divided them all, I also, and I went from one end of my flower bed all the way to the other end of the flower bed with just those two clumps. Then two years later, last year, I divided them again and took 30 to Affinity Estates. So everything got Agriform tabs, everything got Dr. Earth Grow. I think back then uh, I could still get those four pound bags of Biotone. And uh, I was using uh, the all purpose Biotone, uh, Biotone Plus, which has mycorrhiza. Don't get mixed up. Flip the, those bags around because I don't think a spoma puts mycorrhiza in everything. I think they put beneficial bacteria in there, but look for endo and ecto mycorrhizal fungi uh, on the back of those packages. Um, and, if, and if it doesn't have it, I would go get the, the Dr. Earth Pure Gold all-purpose fertilizer. That's what I would do for eight bucks. So anyway, the, all those hostas got all of that. And so the ability to pay it forward with these, with hostas is, makes, it makes it very easy to do that when you're putting those tablets on and you're using the, the beneficial fungus. And you can use, you know, the way I look at the beneficial fungus, I don't know, it's, it's cheap enough nowadays that you should be putting it in everything because those those multi-purpose fertilizers that have mycorrhizal fungi in them they have endo and ecto mycorrhizal so i mean it, it's going to work for everything but your azaleas your rhododendrons cabbage uh blueberries orchids i mean there's tons of there's not tons there's five percent of the plants in the world don't have a relationship with mycorrhizal fungi so it is what it is but um and then these pugster blue butterfly bush uh haven't really been showing up but I don't know. I don't care. I love them. They kind of... So, when the Black Eyed Susans first got here, they kind of got picked on by the uh, Pugster Blues because the Pugster Blues were doing so well and I was gushing over them constantly. Um, now, tables have turned. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, yeah, that's why you should be nice to everybody. Just be nice to everybody. That's how that works. Because you never know when you're going to have a rough year and uh, you kind of need somebody to lean on a little bit. All right. Those are words of wisdom from Landscape Rescue. My name's Stuart Moore. Thank you very much for letting me into your home to talk about my plans.